Hey there. Um, I got a couple of questions yesterday about 1 John 1, 9, and I answered it, but there was all kinds of noise in the video, so I'm trying again. Um, and I got to make this real quick. Uh, I don't know why I got, so, I mean, I got the questions, like five or six different questions about 1 John 1, 9, and it wasn't what my message was about. But uh, what I do see is that people seem to think that 1 John 1, 9 teaches that God will forgive them if they confess. But if they do not confess, he will not forgive them. And the, you know, the verse is, uh, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Um, you can't take that verse and, and use it to contradict Paul's doctrine uh, of justification and the fact that Christ, through his one offering, obtained redemption and the forgiveness of sins. He forgave all of our sins on the cross to tell us die. Debt paid in full, it is finished. Uh, and Christ is the propitiation. And First John teaches that, that if he says, I write these things to you that nobody, that you may not sin, but if any man sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, who himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not only our sins, but the sins of the whole world. And uh, the fact that he's the propitiation for the sins of the whole world means that every sin is forgiven. Past tense, present tense, future tense. Everybody. And First John... Uh, talks about the propitiation and the only time we see that in the New Testament is Romans 3 where in the propitiation God's righteousness is manifest he holds forth Christ as the vindication of his own righteousness in forgiving the sins that are past now that he was talking about the sins that were committed prior to the death of Christ but also that he may be just in the justifier who believe in Jesus. Um, we believe in Jesus, and he is our justifier, and he is vindicated as being just in justifying us and forgiving our sins in the one-time offering of Jesus Christ. And that's what the propitiation is, and that's why John calls him uh, Jesus Christ the Righteous. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the Righteous, who is the propitiation for our sins. Um, now, the law is what uh, is against us and demands justice, and the enemy as well is against us in the court of heaven, so to speak. He's the accuser, using the law to condemn us. But God set forth Jesus Christ as the propitiation so that he may be righteous in forgiving us, and then he set forth Christ as the advocate. So he's the propitiation and the advocate, and I always say the court is rigged in our fa favor because the Father is for us, and the Son is for us, and the Son is the lawyer and the judge. All judgment has been given to the Son of Man. Um, he has authority to execute judgment, and yet he's there as our advocate, and he's the propitiation. So that, and he's the advocate with the Father. So he's not there pleading with the Father to forgive us as if God doesn't want to but Jesus is pleading with him. No, he's an advocate with the Father. They're both advocating for us. The accuser is Satan and the law. Um, and God is being justified in forgiving us. So when you understand that, that this is what's behind the forgiveness of our sins, and then it says uh, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. That justice, that righteousness, is connected to the fact that he laid out of Christ as the propitiation, meaning that the forgiveness of sins is already there. And Colossians says, we in him we have redemption and the forgiveness of sins. And you can see that all through the New Testament, that our sins have been forgiven based on the one-time offering of Christ. We're not offering another offering. And God is not forgiving us again. He's already forgiven us. So that's the doctrine. I mean, that's just the truth in Scripture. So you can't take First John and make it contradict what the rest of the Scripture says and suddenly say, well, God is withholding forgiveness until you confess. And then you make confession into a work, right? 
and it's a dead work. And we talked about dead works. Dead works are those things that you do because you don't believe in the blood of Jesus Christ and you're trying to satisfy your conscience before God and obtain forgiveness or obtain right standing. No, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, having been justified by faith. We've been justified by faith in the one-time offering of Jesus Christ. And we can't go count that blood as an unclean thing and go back and say, well, it didn't actually secure redemption and the forgiveness of my sins. I still need to do something else. Whether it is doing penance or whether an act of confession is what you think it takes. See, it's not the confession of sins as an act or a work that obtains forgiveness any more than it would have been the sacrifices that the priest offered in the holy uh, in the in the uh, outer court. You know, they offered up the sacrifices, but those were a picture pointing to Jesus Christ. They couldn't put their trust in those sacrifices. They had to trust in God's promise concerning uh, Christ. Just as we count on God's uh, finished work in Christ, we look back at it, and we are justified and forgiven because of faith. It's our faith in the blood that has secured forgiveness for us, not any action that we take. So confession can't be turned into an action or a work, um, or else you're back in dead works. No, it's not confession, it's our faith. So what is First John talking about there? Well, actually, he's talking in abs... I believe he's speaking in absolute terms. I've said it many times that First John is not a book that's teaching us how to have fellowship. It's a book how to distinguish between a genuine believer, child of God, who's justified by faith in the propitiation, or an antichrist Cain uh, walker who rejects God's way of justifying sinners, doesn't believe that he has sinned, lies. He walks in darkness, he's lying, the truth is not in him. He says he has fellowship with God, uh, even though he hates the brethren and rejects the propitiation, the way God justifies. And he says he has fellowship with God, he says he knows God, he says he loves God, while he hates the brethren, and he lies and says he doesn't have sin. So first John was talking about walking in the light versus walking in the darkness. And walking in the darkness means that there's no truth in you. And walking in the light means that you've received the light, which is the word of life, which was manifested. Uh, and the apostles bore witness to it and, and handled the word of life, which is Christ himself. And then they said, we, we preach these things to you that you may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son. And then he says, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us of all of our sin. And see, the fellowship there is the fellowship with one another. It's not talking about fellowship with God per se. It is the fellowship with the Father and the Son, but it's distinguishing the fact that the believers have fellowship with one another, while the Cain antichrists who walk in darkness do not. They don't have fellowship. They've gone out from us. They're of the world. They hate the message. They hate the brethren. They deny the only thing that can make us righteous, which is the blood of Jesus Christ. And they even deny that they have sin. Of course they're not in the fellowship. And he said, I'm writing these things to, to you about those who seduce you. You know, There's a real problem that there were false believers among the, among the churches who were saying, we don't have sin, we have fellowship with God, we're more righteous than you, we love God with all our heart, and yet they hate the brother, brothers, cast them out of the fellowship, and refuse to even acknowledge that they were sons of God, because they did not accept the way God says that we're born of God, which is, we believe that Jesus Christ came in the flesh. Whoever believes that Jesus Christ came in the flesh is born of God. And whoever has that profession evidences that they're born of God. They were rejecting the brethren. So that's what 1 John is actually about. And I've said that many times. I've taught on it. It comes down to 1 John 3, which is, Brethren, let us love one another, and not as Cain, who was of the evil one, and slew his brother, because Abel's deeds were righteous, and that is his offering of the blood, uh, which is a picture of the propitiation, and his were evil. He offered his works. He did not accept or set his seal on what God testified concerning the way sinners can be justified and known as the sons of God. And he hated Abel. 
And that's how these Cain antichrists who walk in darkness go. They hate the brethren and they accuse us of all kinds of things and say we're not believers. And you say, yes, I am. I have the profession. I believe in Jesus Christ. They say, no, where's your works? You know, and not only that, but they get so mad that they're willing to kill us. <laughs> they don't have eternal life biting in them. And that is the sin unto death. And it's the sin that a believer cannot commit. Uh, so there are sins in First John that a brother can commit. And if you see him sin, a sin that is not unto death, you're to pray and God will give him life because he's a brother. But there's a sin that's unto death. And he says, I, I say you shouldn't pray for that. And that is the sin mentioned in 1 John 3 that says we can't have this sin, we can't do this sin because it's seed abides in us. And that is the sin of murder in our heart, which shows that we don't have eternal life and we don't believe the gospel. We can't hate the brethren the way Cain does. We cannot reject their testimony without rejecting the gospel itself. I've taught this a lot. Um, okay, so going back to 1 John 1, 9 then. What's he talking about there? Well, 1 John 1, 9, he says, If we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Uh, he doesn't say, and bring us into fellowship. No, he already told us. So, so 1 John 1, 9 is not a fellowship verse. It doesn't tell you that that's what you need to do in order to have fellowship with God. No, he already told us what we need to do to have fellowship with God, which is to walk in the light. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with, not just with God, but with one another, with the believers. And in that fellowship, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us of all our sins. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us of our sins. There is a flow in the fellowship with the Father and with the Son and with the believers that is a fellowship in love and truth, and it's a fellowship of acknowledging the brothers, and acknowledging the gospel, which is to walk in the light. To walk in the light is to receive the truth and be of the truth, according to 1 John. And it, that truth is based on the word of life that was manifested and was beheld. And that life uh, was the light of man. Okay, And that's Christ himself. He is the light and he's the life. And in the fellowship, there is a flow and that flow brings the cleansing of the blood practically and uh, the fellowship with each other. Uh, so the way we get our sins for cleansed practically, like, you know, Jesus gave us the picture in John 13. He said, you're, in, you're clean, but you have need for your feet to be washed. And he girded himself with a towel and washed their feet. Now, he only did that for his disciples in the upper room after Judas left and said they were in him. They were members of the vine. And that's a picture of the church. We've been grafted into Christ, and we've already been clean because of the word we received. He said, You've, you are clean because of the word I've spoken to you. We've received the word of life, and we've been cleansed. We just need our feet washed, and that's our walk. So if we walk in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us of our sin. That's talking about being in the fellowship, acknowledging the brethren, and having a fellowship based on the gospel and the truth, walking in the truth, based on the word of life, which cleanses us. And in that fellowship, there is a flow of the Spirit that also brings a cleansing. A lot of people just need a cleansing from, they just need fellowship, you know, uh, Communion does that. Prayer with brothers and sisters does that. Speaking to the truth to one another in love does that. It supplies. It's the measure of the operation. It's the, it's the operation of the measure in each one part that causes the building up of the body uh, in love. We all need our gift functioning, so to speak, to speak the truth in love to envelop people in the fellowship, which is the cleansing as well. Um, so... First John doesn't really talk too much about how to be in the fellowship. It just talks about the fact that it's in the light. And it's the fellowship, it, that's where the cleansing is. And fellowship is freely given. It comes by faith in the blood. It becomes by faith in the propitiation, faith in Jesus Christ, faith in the word of life. The life was manifested, you know. And uh, so then this whole thing about if we confess our sins... Well, he had just, he's been, he's been saying that there's those who don't walk in the light. They walk in darkness and they lie 
And one of their lies is that they do not, they say they do not have sin, and they do not sin. He says, if we say we have no sin, uh, or if we say we have not sinned, we lie and the truth is not in us. And then he also talks about how they walk in darkness. Um, there's like a multifaceted description of these people who say they have no sin, say they don't have need of the blood, deny Jesus came in the flesh, meaning they deny his work on the cross and its effectiveness, and they deny the brethren and hate them. They're antichrists. That's who he's writing about. Versus we who confess we have sin. We do confess our sins. You know, we're not saying we're not sinners. And when, but, but, but he's not talking about a practice. First John 1, 9 is not a practice of, well, I confess my sin and then there, then he'll be faithful and then he'll be just to forgive me. No, I'm already forgiven. And he says to cleanse me of all unrighteousness. Well, he already told me that if I walk in the light as he is in the light, uh, the, we have fellowship with one another. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us of our sin. That's talking about walking in the truth and believing the truth. And that is something that's absolutely true of believers. We believe the truth. We believe the gospel. And we are clean. Okay? But then as we walk in the truth, we also have the fellowship which practically cleanses us. So there is that aspect, you know. The practical cleansing of sin, that, that sense of filthiness, that sense of condemnation can be washed off just by fellowship. That's why it's such a serious thing where if somebody, if, if a whole group of people who are holier than thou separate from someone, for example, because they smoke or something that, you know, it's not a major sin to where it's fornication or something where they're damaging the body of Christ and the testimony. They just have a weakness, and yet people, well, that, that guy watches TV. Well, that guy watches, that guy listens to music. And they, they separate themselves based on these uh, minor things. Well, they're withholding the fellowship. They're not in the fellowship anyway if they're doing that. But in principle, they're withholding the fellowship from someone, which is the very means for that person to get free of anything anyway. <laughs> you know, they're not washing each other's feet. They're not interested in that. They're interested in pointing fingers. But the extreme of that is these antichrists who are so holier than thou that they won't even admit you're a believer. Based on the fact that you're a believer, they won't say that you're a child of God or that you're righteous or that you're justified by faith in the blood. They'll say that's not enough. The blood didn't do it. And uh, But this whole confess your sin thing is, is, a, is, I believe, speaking about an absolute thing where... Yes, I confess I'm a sinner. Now, practically, if I sin and my conscience is bothering me about it, what I need to do is exercise faith in the blood to come forward to Christ with a heart full assurance of faith uh, and having a heart sprinkled from an evil conscience and a body washed with pure water. It's in the coming forward by faith in the blood that I receive my cleansing. Okay, or, you know, and it's not a new cleansing. It's just I experience what I have. I'm washed. I'm renewed, as Paul would call it, and that's just walking according to the Spirit and walking by faith. I'm renewed in the spirit of my mind, putting on Christ, whatever you want to call it. That is one side of it. But what John is talking about is, look, we're not like these antichrists who say they don't have sin. And they lie, and the truth is not in them. No, we're the believers who know we have sin, but we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous, who is the propitiation for our sins. And it's only by faith in him that we receive any benefit. You can confess your sins all you want and say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, and vow to never to do it again. But God will say, I don't believe your vow. You are going to do it again unless I'm in your life and unless I'm keeping you in my mercy. And I don't need your sorrow. I need your faith. And you're an unbelief. The more you say you're sorry, the more I know that you don't understand what I accomplished and what I've provided. So there is such thing as godly sorrow, but it should lead to repentance. And repentance is the change of mind that allows you to embrace, repentance unto faith, but embrace the truth and come forward boldly to the throne of grace. And, you know, maturity in the Christian life is about how fast do you come to Jesus? I love it when people say, 
that I used to take three weeks to overcome a sin because of all the condemnation, but now, in f- five minutes later, I'm there in, in the presence of God enjoying the benefit of my salvation. I'm crucified to five minutes ago. It's under the blood. Thank you, Jesus. And they're back in the fellowship. That's the strength of the Christian life. That's the secret of the Christian life is to walk in the fellowship. And we we have a naturalistic view of 1 John 1, 9 that says God's withholding the fellowship if we don't confess and we turn confession into a work. And 1 John 1, 9 isn't even about the fellowship. It doesn't say anything about fellowship. <laughs> the cleansing is in the fellowship, though. Uh and that comes through the belief in the truth. Okay? Uh, we write these things to you that you may have fellowship with us. Our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. And if we walk according to the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us of our sins. But then, at, on an absolute level, if you don't confess that you have sin, then you have no cleansing or forgiveness. But if you do confess your sin, you have the uh, forgiveness. It's already in Christ. In Him we have redemption, the forgiveness of our sins. This is not something that you can take and turn into a work and say God's withholding His forgiveness until you show a certain amount of contrition or confession or anything. No, it's faith in the blood that brings me forward, not confession. Confession is confessing that, yes, I'm a sinner, but I also have an advocate. Yes, I'm a sinner, but I have an offering. Yes, I'm a sinner, but Jesus Christ. It's not confession until you confess what God has said and agree with his testimony concerning his son. And that is what brings the witness of the spirit, which is the fellowship and the washing and all the f- sensation. But you're already washed. You are, you are just washing your feet. You're already clean. You just need your feet washed. That sense of defilement you have. Uh, this is a big topic and I needed longer to cover it, but I got home and I got to take care of some things. I'm going to have to revisit this. Take care.